Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us continue our discussion on deflection of beams. You know, I will try to cover some problems from method of superposition followed by the energy method. My main focus will be on discussing how to approach the problem. The mathematical simplification, I leave it as an exercise that also helps you to ruminate over what is discussed in the class and please do the mathematical simplification yourself. You know, in the last class I asked you to do this as a homework and you know how students operate, so it is better that I discuss it again. We have done by moment area method, what is the end deflection and also the slope at the load application point for both these cases and these two loads are simultaneously applied to the beam which you can think of as superposition of a end load and a bending moment and this is a statically determinate problem, fine. You have individual solutions available and you simply add those solutions whether it is a displacement or, or a deflection or a slope. Our focus is to get uh, what is the combined effect and we have already derived what is V1, V1 is minus PLQ by 3 EI. I have said that PLQ by 3 EI, EI is a very, very important result. We may be using it repeatedly, it is worth remembering that and you have theta 1 as minus PL squared by 2 EI. We have also seen for a bending moment, what is the value of uh, v2 and theta2. So, when I have a combined loading, the principle of superposition says I can add them. For illustration purposes, these deformations or deflections are shown very, very large. In reality, they are very small and you can comfortably add them so that I get what is the tip deflection and also the slope at the tip, simply the arithmetic addition of the values that we have got for individual problems. So, V becomes minus of PLQ by 3 EA plus ML squared by 2 EA. See, the idea here is I have also mentioned assigning the sign to these quantities, you have a procedure where you plot the deflection and then label it, that is the best way to do it. If you do a double integration or integration four times, if you follow the sign convention, all the quantities are obtained with the desired sign. In un, none of the other methods, you have that luxury, okay. Here I have shown this as minus, but uh, you may not get it from the mathematics as such. Now, let us look at a statically indeterminate system. I suppose you recognize that this is statically indeterminate, okay. So, the question is what is the reaction at B, which you could not have solved in your earlier course on rigid body mechanics. Unless I bring in the deformation picture, it is not possible to solve using equations of statics. Now, I will split this as two problems. You should also know how to split it as two problems. It is a statically indeterminate problem and uh, you know you have been trained when I have a support like this, when I have a fixed support, you have in the fixed support slope is 0, deflection is also 0. So, you know how to sketch this deflected shape, anticipated deflection shape. What I do is in the first case, I remove this load, this support. I make this as a statically determinate problem and if you look at the table, this is what I said, the moment I go into 
method of superposition, you will be provided with the table and your only exercise is to filter out which solution you should use it for your calculations. That exercise you have to do and our focus is to find out uh, the reaction. So, I have just uh, put the deflection and the deflection is put as y. This is what I said. People have used y as a symbol or v as a symbol and instead of phi they use theta, instead of rho they use capital R. So, all of these uh, symbols are seen in the books. So, you should be comfortable by looking at them repeatedly and you can also sketch what is the deflected pattern when I have a uniformly distributed load. And I can have the second problem. So, from this it is possible for me to find out the deflection. I call this as V1. I get this as minus W L power 4 by 80. And here I remove that uh, distributed load. I replace this as a reaction Rb, fine. And you know this is nothing but a cantilever. And with this load, what way you anticipate the deflected shape? The deflected shape will be like this. This you should be very comfortable to visualize. Visualization is very, very, very important. So, when I calculate the deflection, I should put the appropriate sign and get the net fine. But here the question is to find out the reaction Rb. So, when I have the reaction Rb, I anticipate that there is 0 deflection at this point in the actual beam. So, I equate these two deflections by magnitude and I can easily calculate what is the value of the force or the which you could not have calculated in your rigid body mechanics. Even though it is a statically indeterminate problem, method of superposition helps you to do that. I hope I have the value of Rb. Yeah, it is V1 plus V2 should go to 0. So, I get Rb as 3 Wl by 8. So, a very useful application of method of superposition. Then we move on to another problem, you know, what is this uh, problem? Can you solve it by rigid body mechanics? Is it statically determinate or indeterminate? First you should recognize that when a problem is posed to you, you should uh, recognize whether it is statically determinate or indeterminate. If I do not have a spring, it is statically determinate. If I have a spring, it is statically indeterminate. It is not possible for you to solve using the principle of statics. But you know a spring uh, will deform. So, you can split this as uh, sub problems and also visualize the deformation picture. So, one problem is just look at the end load, other problem is just look at the spring attached. Spring is going to pro produce a normal force. The question here is how do you visualize the deflection there? I have said that these two points are important. So, I have uh, labeled this as y1 and this as y2. And I have the second problem where I replace the spring by a force. And which way should I put the force? Ah, all that you should apply your mind blindly you should not do, you should understand the physics of the problem. When I put the tip load, when the beam is pushed downwards, the spring will try to pull it up. You know, if you do not look at these issues and do not put the problems properly, then you are solving a different problem. So, you should apply your uh, sense of visualization. So, I will put the reaction like this. Can you attempt to draw the deflected pattern for this? How many of you recollect what are the nuances that we have discussed? It is very important because you know in a hurry to solve problem you miss the nuances. I have load only up, uh, applied at B, the portion B C is unloaded and it is uh, put out upwards and you have this, uh, you can sketch it. What is the way you anticipate the 
deflected pattern here straight line that is very good. So, I have also showing it by a different line to emphasize that this has the rotation of the slope at this point B and it remains straight. Suppose I want to do it by energy method when it is rigid it cannot store any en energy fine that is also you have to use it which we have seen it beautifully in the experimental uh, this one in the previous class that is also shown there and I label this deflection as y3 label this deflection as y4. So, if I find out the deflections y1, y2, y3, y4 my job is done. I am going to discuss how to do this rest of the mathematics left to you fine that simplification which you can do. And the first uh, issue is uh, you know what is the solution that I should look from the table. You have a generic solution available for a cantilever with a tip load not a tip load, but uh, it is uh, at a distance b from the tip. You have the expression for v, you also have the expression for the theta. I have that probably it is not uh, coming up ok. You know I have this as the problem, I have to find out if I have to find out what is y2 y2 can you tell me how what is y2 you do not have to even look up that uh, expression what is the value of y2 I have a cantilever with a tip load p that is all fine. So, you should uh, it is a very useful result p l q by 3 a is a very useful result I have not even put the symbol I mean uh, sign sign here the idea here is you know you will have this and in the, di in the diagram it is put where, where is u2 y2 when I have y2 listed in the diagram if I give the magnitude that is also sufficient. I should not make a mix up in my mathematics ok. And uh, at x equal to L by 2 you can substitute here and you can find out what is the value of y1 when I simplify I will get this. I get this y1 as phi p l q by 48 e l. So, the first exercise is you should uh, look at the table which gives you generic solution which one you need to use it for this given problem that is the first exercise and learn how to interpret what is stated in the expression because it says how to handle this bracket ok. That is all very very simple you should be alert that is all. So, I have calculated y 1 and y 2 in a very simplistic manner and I also need uh, the value of theta at least the next uh, step we need this that is given as w a squared by 2 e a. So, you should know how to use this information that we will see for the spring force there is spring force which is acting here and uh, can you tell me what is the deflection here y3 you do not have to see anything r l cube by r l by 2 cube ok that is what you have to do it yeah, the, the length is l by 2. So, you have to do that r l by 2 whole cube by 3 e i certain things you know you have to pick up speed if you so, you are expected to solve as many problems as possible before you come for the examination and we you have to remember p l cube by 3 e i that is a very very useful result. So, I have r l cube by 24 e i and how do I find out the deflection at c? Find you, you need the slope here and you also need to know the length ok. So, this will be addition of y 3 plus something ok. So, I have this as uh, theta 3 is given from this expression w a square by 2 e a, a is here is uh, l by 2. So, r l by 2 whole square by 2 e a. So, you should know how to handle these equations. So, very very simple it is only high school knowledge is required, but you have to be alert and careful 
and uh, you have this as a straight line it is emphasized in the diagram also. So, I have y4 as y3 plus theta 3 into L by 2. See the theta 3 into L by 2 we are doing it because we are handling very small deformation that aspect you should remember fine that aspect you should remember. So, I get this as uh, R L cube by 24 E i plus R into L by 2 whole squared by 2 E i multiplied by L by 2. So, I get this as phi R L cube by 48 E i. Once I determine these deflections, finding out the spring force is doable and also the end deflection. So, that is what I am going to summarize it here. This is looked upon as summation of two problems, one with the end load, another with the spring force. I cautioned that when you look at the spring force, you should put the spring force in the right direction. If you do not put it in the right direction, you are solving a different problem. So, you should physically respond to what is given in the problem statement. So, I have uh, y3 and y4 are uh, available now, y3 is rl cube by 24 ei, y4 is phi rl cube by 48 ei and how do I get the spring force? I know y1 and y3. So, your spring force is nothing but k times y1 minus y3. So, which you can uh, do the simplification and when you do this the spring force comes to be phi p by 2 multiplied 1 plus 24 e i by k l cube. You may also verify my simplification if there are any typographical errors please uh, alert me and you can also get the deflection at the end. What is the deflection at the end? What is the deflection at the end? Y2 minus Y4, that is all as simple as that Y2 minus Y4. So, you can draw the deflected shape, assign the sign at the end, that is physically appreciating the problem and getting the magnitudes, that is a better way to handle some method of superposition. And this turns out to be, please verify my simplification, PLQ by 3EI multiplied by 1 minus. 25 divided by 32 multiplied by 24 EI by KL cube plus 1, okay. So, I expect you to do the arithmetic simplifications. Then we move on to another problem. What is this beam? I have support here, I have support here, I have support here. It is continuously supported and uh, it is statically indeterminate. I have written it in the title itself, but you should be able to recognize that this is statically indeterminate. And the question is find the reaction forces at B and C. And here I said that you should be trained on visualizing what is the anticipated deflected shape. You know the supports, fine. And I have a distributed load. What do you anticipate as the deflected shape here? that you can draw. What is the anticipated shape? It will come down, is not it? I can draw that, I can draw this, that I can draw. The idea to remember is here you will have a slope because this is not a fixed end. How do you represent a fixed end? The slope has to be 0, deflection is also has to be 0. So, I can, I can sketch what is the portion here join these two intelligently. Is the idea clear? See, you should also, the main purpose of getting into principle of superposition is to train you to visualize what happens to the beam even before you start solving it. If you have that anticipation, you can also verify have you done any mistakes in your mathematical development. So, the deflected shape, possible deflected shape is this. So, the training in method of superposition is to make you visualize. Do not treat this as a problem of simple integration. 
it has a life, there is a physical problem, you should interpret the physics of the problem as well as possible. So, now I can split this as how many problems? 3 problem, that is very good. So, I have a problem number 1, I have a problem number 2, I have problem number 3 and you should put those uh, reactions appropriately and also filter out what is the relevant solution that you should take it out from this. See, I need two of that. I need one for the cantilever and also for the in-between in load. Now, you know, after solving a few problems, you find how useful the cantilever solution, it might as well remember it because when you solve several problems, it automatically gets into your blood. So, for these two, we have already seen the solution. So, you know how to get the deflected shapes and also the value of deflection. Okay. So, I have this as uh, y 1 c plus y 2 c plus y 3 c should be 0. So, that is what happens here. So, that will help me to get me what is R c. I would expect you to simplify and solve it yourself and get R c as 12 W L by 56. Please correct me if I have made any simplification errors and y b is 0. So, I will have y 1 b, y 2 b plus y 3 b should be equal to 0. So, this gives me R b as 19 W L by 56. So, you have to recognize how many sub problems I should have for a given uh, loading and recognize what is, whether it is statically determinate or indeterminate for your understanding because when you split this, they are all statically determinate problems and you have from the table what solution that you have to call out. That also requires training and you know to uh, interpret this, you should see what is the definitions given. So, handle that very carefully, fine. You know, one of the most useful methods in engineering uh, science development is handling energies, okay. The moment you come to deformable solids, we say the specimen is going to deform that means it has capacity to store the energy and to make our life simple, we say it is a reversible process, it gives out the energy, there are no frictional losses. Even though frictional losses happen in uh, actual systems, you may try to minimize it and your mathematics becomes much simpler if these are reversible processes. Okay. And for illustration, you take a spring, but you know very well when I pull a spring, it has a very complex uh, uh, response. We will also solve this problem later, but here what is uh, looked at is you have an engineering material which deforms similar to a spring. So, I have a axial rod which is pulled out, imagine it like this. Okay. And to make our life simple because we want to develop equation in a manner that if I differentiate the energy with respect to the force, I get the deflection. That is what we are going to prove. We may live on linear systems, but to illustrate the important difference why I have to work on what is known as complementary energy, we start with a nonlinear spring. What is the in, in implication of a nonlinear spring, when I draw the force deflection relation, it is not going to be a straight line, it will be of some curve. Okay. I have the curve like this, it is a nonlinear spring. And what is the energy stored? And in all these problems, so far we have discussed. Whenever we show a load T, the load P was applied gradually from 0 to P. It is not that you have an impact load of P. We implicitly understood that these loads are gradually applied and the deflection is seen as the load is increased. So, the area under the curve is going to give you the energy stored. 
So, you have the potential energy I have uh, d delta. So, I can write this as uh, energy is given a symbol capital U. So, do not uh, mix it up with small u, small u is used for displacement, capital U is used for energy. I have this from integrate integrated from 0 to delta f d delta that is what you will write here is not it. So, when I do this I show it pictorially that we are calculating the area under the curve. If I know what is the force deflection relation I can evaluate this quantity numerically, but this is not convenient for me to use it for me to get the deflection. Now, I look at not this energy, by look at the energy in this zone that is labeled as a complementary potential energy, because the spring is non-linear, you will have some other quantity as complementary energy. Is the idea clear? What I have area under this curve or what I have area under this curve will be different, distinctly different, they are not same. Here I have taken a small element and I have written the integral f d delta. If I do the same thing here, what way you anticipate? d f will come, okay. that is what is we are interested in that. When the point of application of a variable force f undergoes a displacement delta, complementary energy which is always labeled as u star capital u star is defined as i have this df so i find out uh, what happens uh, for the entire uh, load application so i put this as delta into df and if i show this pictorially i have this as the area and these two are different you have the complementary potential energy area is different, but this is very nice for me to do it. Suppose I differentiate this expression, I differentiate du star by df, I will get the deflection. In this chapter, we are finding out what is the deflection. If I calculate the energy stored in the body, if I differentiate when I have a non-linear system, I should find out the complementary energy. Can you quickly see what is the simplification in linear systems? Think about it, I am going to discuss it. Okay. So, this is the complementary energy and you know for sure, u will have some magnitude, u star will have some other magnitude as long as the system is non-linear. Suppose I have the system is linear. Okay what way it will happen. So, you have the Castiglianos theorem, okay. what does the theorem says? For a small increment in the load delta F i, this is again a very important statement, if the inline displacement, it is also called work absorbing component is delta i then one has. So, you have to understand, see when I have the body like this, it will deform at the point of load application, it can move in a generic path, fine. Which is the one which causes uh, the work or the energy to be stored? Only the work absorbing component that is the component of displacement in the direction of the force. This is a very important statement in inline displacement. Okay, so, I have the force F3 and I say that it has a, a deflection in this fashion. This deflection can be resolved into one along the force F3 and one perpendicular to that and what you have as a displacement here, this is called inline displacement and that would be labeled as delta A and this will be labeled as Fi, fine only this contributes to energy storage or work done. And what does this theorem says? This theorem says delta i multiplied by delta f i equal to delta u star and uh, 
when you say you can also write this as delta u star divided by delta f i equal to delta i in the limit delta f i tends to 0. I can write this as uh, dou u star by dou f i you get the displacement delta i. It is a very powerful uh, theorem which we would uh, keep using it even in your higher studies. If the total complementary energy u star of a loaded system is expressed in terms of the loads that is the key point. I should express my energy stored in the system as an expression of loads, I should get that. The inline deflection at any particular loading, loading point is obtained by differentiating u star with respect to the load at that point. So, I have to essentially get a mathematical expression, differentiate it, then substitute the values. That is how you have to solve the problem. When you have the energy method, even if it is given as numbers, you must convert that into symbols, so that you are in a position to differentiate it, finally put the numbers. So, what happens in a linear system? Cassegrain's theorem, we have developed it deliberately for a non-linear system to drive home the point, we need to work with complementary energy, you should never forget that. When I take a linear system, it so happens whether it is a, when I have a linear system, I have a line like this. So, automatically this will be of equal areas. So, I have this as uh, u star equal to delta into d f, that is also equal to f d delta. So, I can calculate the expression in a very comfortable manner. And for a linear system, what you have as dou u star by dou f i equal to delta i simply reduces to dou u by dou f i equal to delta i. It is a very powerful theorem, it looks very simple, it takes a very small time to develop, but its utility is very significant, very complex problems you can solve. I have said in our development of moment curvature relation, we ignored the effect of shear is not it? And I said that I am going to tell you a method by which you will be able to find out what is the shear contribution to the reflection, we will solve that as a problem. So, many of those seemingly complex problems you can easily handle if you visualize it from the energy point of view, but the development is very simple. Now, what we need to understand is how to calculate the energy, but before that you know you may not have the luxury that uh, I want to find out the reflection at this point or this point or some other point. I may not have a load there, one of the requirement of this is I should have a load acting at that point, fine. And I should uh, differentiate with respect to that, then I will get the inline displacement. The method itself says, it says fictitious load method, that means you, wherever you want to find out the reflection, you introduce a load, okay. If a deflection delta is desired at a point where there is no load or in a direction which is not in line with the load, introduce a load and find out the energy because of that Q. That it can be a point here, it can be it can be that is not in line with this. I want to find out what is perpendicular to that. Or I can also have in another point introduce a fictitious load q at the desired point in the desired direction, okay. express the elastic energy in terms of f i and q, then you have dou u by dou q, after you differentiate you make q equal to 0, you will get delta. This also we will solve, we will try to solve the problem then you will understand, it is a very powerful technique. It is a in a jiffy you can solve uh, even complex problems, you do not have to do complex integration or anything like that, very simply you can do that. So, now the focus is how to calculate the energies, strain energy, okay, we will go and look at that. Now, here again though I have shown a spring, imagine that I have a rod made of aluminum or steel which is uh, pulled out 
and I have a gradual load application. When I have a gradual load application, it is a triangle. So, I have this as one half of P into delta. So, what I have force into displacement is work done. Because the load is applied gradually, I have this as half. So, you should never forget that. Long time back, you have done virtual work. There, the physics is different. Okay. Here, I have this load applied gradually. I have the quantity one half coming into the picture. So, similarly, you know, I can develop the set of equations if I have an axial stress or if I have a shear stress because we have already discussed what happens when a member is subjected to tension, when a member is subjected to torsion, when a member is subjected to bending, you know what are the stresses developed. Once you know what is the area, I can convert the stress into force. So, what this expression says is force into displacement multiplied by one half. Same thing we will also do it here. So, we will do it for uh, axial stress. Okay. I have this as uh, um, epsilon x and I have this as force sigma x dy dz gives me the force and epsilon x dx gives me the deflection. Okay, the elongation, inline uh, displacement, inline displacement it gives, one half. So, when I do this, I get an expression one half of sigma x epsilon x dt. So, if I go to torsion, find out what is the stress. For torsion, we have to go to shear stress, but if I go to bending, I know the expression for sigma x, I know the expression for epsilon x. So, I can calculate what is the energy stored because of a bending moment. Is the idea clear? So, now I go to shear stress, when I apply the shear stress what happens? You know gamma x y is used, gamma x y is the way the mathematics got developed, only when the tensorial transformation came people understood that you should always use one half of gamma x y for transformation, but you write this like this. So, I have the force as tau x y dx dz and the inline displacement as gamma x y d y. So, I get this as one half of tau x y gamma x y d t. So, these are very fundamental expressions. Now, I will go and see what happens in an axial load, what happens in a torsional load, what happens in a bending load. I have this as uh, p by a sigma x, epsilon x is p by a e. So, when I do this, I get this as one half of p squared by a e into d x okay? because I can write the volume as uh, d a into d x. So, I have the famous expression u equal to one half of integral 0 t l, you are talking about a slender member fine p squared by a e into d x. Now, let us go to torsion. So, when I go to torsion, I have tau theta z as uh, m t r by i p gamma theta z is mtr by gip. We have a recipe how to get the energy when I know the strains and stresses. So, I get the torsional energy as integral 0 t l mt squared by 2 gip dz. See, look at the similarity between the two. It is very, very similar. The expressions are very similar. It is easy to remember also, easy to derive and easy to remember also. Can you anticipate what way you will get it for bending? It is very similar, it is cyclically it is coming. Okay. So, I have the sigma x and epsilon x is there and uh, when I say bending, I have, we are talking about uh, pure bending and then away from the load application points, away from the load application points you have this. So, I have uh, epsilon sigma x and epsilon x. So, I can find out what is uh, the energy stored and when you simplify this also has identical picture like this. I have this as integral 0 t l m b squared by 2 e i z z into d x. All these three expressions are very similar. Okay. You will ap appreciate the 
utility when you solve a practical problem. I have a problem where I have a member like this. It's like you are having a hand like this. Somebody is putting a load. So you should visualize what happens to your shoulder. Fine. What happens in this section A B? Section A B is subjected to what? Section B C subjected to what? Only torsion. Ah, A B is subjected to torsion as far as bending, and B C is subjected to only bending. And we ignore the shear deformation. We don't want to complicate now. I will solve shear deformation as a separate problem. So, you should recognize that I have to calculate the energies for the torsion and bending. So, first I start with the expressions for the bending which we have already developed. Instead of dx, I have put this as ds because I have a member like this. So, it represents length along the member and you can find out the expression for the bending moment as a function. Strain energy due to shear loading is neglected, that is what I said earlier to start with. So, in section B C, there is only energy due to bending. So, you can write the bending moment is P x. So, I, I had P s squared by 2 E i z z d x, even the sign does not matter okay, because it gets squared. So, P squared L q by 6 E i z z is what I get. In section A B, there is energy due to bending as well as due to constant torque of PL. So, U A B will have contribution from bending energy, contribution from torque. So, I get this as for the bending energy I do like this and for torsional energy I get this PL squared by 2 G A P D X. And you can find out for a circular cross section what is I Z Z and I, I P and you know the interrelationship I P is twice I Z Z. Okay. So, you can simplify it like this mathematically, which is done in the next step. Here I have uh, put U A B as P squared L cube by 6 E I Z Z plus P squared L cube by 2 G I P. And uh, 2 I Z Z equal to I P. So, you can uh, replace it like this. So, I have this as uh, I want to find out what is the deflection at low at the point P, dou u by dou P equal to P L q by E i multiplied by 1 by 3 plus E by 2 g plus 1 by 3. So, I get this as uh, finally 4 P L q by 3 E pi r power 4 multiplied by 5 plus 3 e. You try to solve it by other methods, then you will know the advantage and the conceptual appreciation of this, it comes in a very, very elegant manner. Okay. Now, we move on to understand what happens when you have a shear. It is drawn in a very big picture, wherein you see that I have shear deformation and you have the expression for tau x y, which we have derived v by 2 i z multiplied by h by 2 whole squared minus y 1 squared, y 1 is some distance at y 1. Okay. And when you visualize it pictorially, it is like this, you have shear stress variation, it is varying parabolically. And the interest here is what way this alters the deflection. We will take a very simple problem, we will take a simple problem of cantilever. Okay. If I articulate the problem differently, you have a very sophisticated instrumentation and find out what is the deflection at this point, it will not equate to PLQ by 3 EI, whereas all along we have said it is PLQ by 3 EI. When it is not matching with the experiment, do not blame the experiment, your equipments are very old, that is why it is showing a deviation. You do have very careful experimentation, very sensitive experimentation you can do. You will find there is a different, but difference is very, very small. Now, the idea is how do I calculate this? With the energy method, you bring in the energy due to shear. That is all you have to do. We have all the necessary expressions. Okay. So, I have the bending moment and I have the shear stress, I have the expression like this in the context of this problem 
replace it as p by 2 i h by 2 whole square minus y square I have written it in a generic fashion and u bending is straightforward it is uh, m squared by 2 ei dx. So, this is what I said even the sign if I do not put it properly in the earlier problem I have not put the sign it is getting squared ok. So, it gets absorbed in your mathematics I get this as p squared l by 3 6 ei that is fine. Now, I have to write for the shear ok shear is integral tau squared by 2 g dv which we will have to look at we have already derived this expression ok. I have this as 1 by 2 g you have to interpret this mathematics properly see I have h I can see this as minus h by 2 to plus h by 2 and I can also visualize that I have a small uh, this one dy because the shear stress varies as a function of the distance from the neutral axis. For this entire length I can have this as L into B into dy is your volume ok and that I integrate from minus h by 2 to plus h by 2. So, I would expect you to do this mathematics I am going to show what is the result that I am getting it. So, in the first stage of simplification I get this I am not substituted for i equal to bhq by 12 when I substitute for that also I even here I have not substituted, but this simplification is done when I finally substitute I get this u shear as 3 p squared l by 5 a g. So, what you can actually do is you can take a realistic problem supply the values of p l a and g for the material then you will know still I have not got the deflection deflection is nothing but dou u by dou p and the energy is bending plus shear ok. So, I will take the bending plus shear and differentiate it with respect to p u is given. So, when I differentiate it with respect to p I get this as p l q by 3 a plus 6 p l by 5 a g that is the deviation from your p l q by 3 a i. So, you can substitute for a given whatever the problem that we have solved earlier or you give a fictitious uh, distance of l and take a slender cross section you will find this contribution is extremely small. So, in this class we have solved a variety of problems by the method of superposition and we have also looked at the powerful method of use of Castiglione's theorem and solving the deflection by using the energy approach and energy approach is very very uh, interesting and uh, there are many numerical methods that are developed based on the energy and it is a very useful simple from a mathematical perspective. Thank you.